I'm going to introduce Dr. Um, Spindler now. Um, you'll hear a lot more about him if you make it to the Garrick Lecture tomorrow night. Um, Dr. Spindler's list of accomplishments is far too long to do justice in the few minutes I have this morning. Um, and um, he graduated from Rutgers College and completed medical school and an orthopedic residency at the University of Pennsylvania, where he was a few years ahead of me and then a few decades ahead of Dr. Shu and Dr. G. Um, he went on to do his um, fellowship um, at the Cleveland Clinic, and eventually um, he trained um, our, our own Dr. Hagen. Um, at Penn, which was over 30 years ago, Kurt was a singularly talented resident who proselytized about the dearth of good clinical outcomes research in orthopedics. And I recall at that time, he decided that he had to help change that. He has spent the rest of his career changing this lack of clinical evidence to remarkable effect at Vanderbilt, then the Cleveland Clinic, and now at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, and now at the Cleveland Clinic in Florida. In recognition of this work, Dr. Spindler has received many of our field's highest awards, and some of them multiple times. He also maintains a busy uh, clinical practice focusing on sports medicine and particularly ACL reconstruction. Um, with that, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Spindler to our grand rounds to discuss the role of cohorts and registries in evidence-based clinical care. I gave a lecture in Emory, and it was also the first time they had grand rounds in three years. So grand rounds are meant to be interactive. I like in person, and I don't like giving lectures virtually because it's like going into a black hole. And so I like in person. You're welcome to ask questions. I hopefully you ask me a lot of questions because that's a lot of fun. And I bet you think this is going to be a boring talk. I hope it's not. It's going to be provocative, and I'm going to change, hopefully change some thoughts. So my disclosures, most of this is uh, is current funding. I do have a conflict with Obert. Obert is a is a EMR system, and we've designed some things to collect patient reported outcomes with Obert. Uh, very little consulting. I can't consult because the NIH grants won't allow me to have any any conflicts. So the concepts today, I want I want to think about value because value is a big buzzword. I want you to think about proms. I want you to think about the clinical question that you're trying to solve. This is not about academics. This is all about you in practice. I'm gonna shift it to about what you do in practice. What's the best evidence and what is our future? What do we have to do in the future? And what you're looking at over here is you're looking at the people that had a 10 point improvement or their improvement in proms across total knees to shoulder instability across a department and end of about a few thousand that you can measure every patient, every time, and every surgeon. So value in medicine, let's talk about it. It's the greatest change in medicine we have now, and we're gonna explain it why. And that has huge implications to how you're gonna be paid in the future. And the second thing is what are proms? And I think you know what it is, but I just wanna refresh that a little bit. So you're in the biggest change in medicine since Medicare. Medicare came in the 60s, changed the reimbursement model. Now the reimbursement model is changing again. It's the value, it's outcome divided by cost. That is not gonna change. The pressures on medicine are, are regardless of the party control in Congress or any party control in Congress because it's driven by the cost. The cost is somewhere 20%, 19% of GDP. It's not gonna go higher. The country cannot afford to spend many more dollars on healthcare because then it takes away from other things like defense or paying the debt or something else they wanna pay for. So the cost is a problem. And when you're at the maximum GDP, then it becomes a rationing model. And now we in orthopedics have to define the outcome. Why? Because we're in a race to the bottom. Everything we talk about is value. And when you look at it is cost. And every department chairman knows it. Everyone looking at the budget knows it. And this value is cost minimization. It's complication avoidance, which is quality. And therefore healthcare has become a commodity. And if you know any of your business colleagues, and if you're in a commodity business, you want to leave because a commodity is commodity businesses get it at the cheapest cost, no matter what, nothing matters. Quality doesn't matter. It's all cost. So we, we in orthopedics have to define what our clinically relevant outcomes are to the patient and to the society. 
The only way to break the race to the bottom, which is not a fun situation to be in, it's like running on a treadmill that next year you have to run faster. And next year you run faster again in order to have the same thing is you're going to have to define quality and systems to improve quality. So it's not only reimbursed on that. The good news is we can do that. We have the tools to do that and we can do that. So patient reported outcomes, we know except for trauma and tumor, majority of orthopedics is we treat pain and function, improve someone's quality of life. The biggest thing is we return them to work. If people aren't working, there's no one to pay the bills. So orthopedics has a great role. And, and proms are very simple. We have pain proms and function proms and quality of life proms. We have them for shoulder. We have them for hip. We have them for knee. We have them for foot and ankle. And these proms have a really rooted scientific basis. They've been used in Meteor, which defines how we do arthroscopy for meniscus tear in OA in the country. They've been used in Mars and, and Moon, uh, ACL. Uh, studies. They've been used in sport, and sport is a uh, is the spine guy stole that from the sports guys. I don't like that, but it's a spine study. And then uh, metric, the trauma folks have not used a lot of proms, but they could use proms as well. And so registries and cohorts have been established in arthroplasty, sports, and hand. That's okay. It's been used and has scientific evidence on on the research side, but now we got to use it on the clinical side to support what we do. And so how do we create a healthcare transformation and how do we learn from things that we, we've developed? And I'll show you more. How do we show the government, the insurance company, the healthcare systems or society, how to allocate limited healthcare dollars in a scientifically valid way? We can do that. It's the use of problems for orthopedics. The good news is we can collect it. We can collect prospective data. We can capture the individual patient. We can use the shared decision-making between the patient and the physician. Those things are reality. Technology allows us to do it, and it's not cost prohibitive. So my bias in orthopedic surgery is we have great value. And I'm not so sure it's a bias because I can back it up with a lot of data. There are not many things you can do to improve someone's pain 50 points on a 100-point scale other than do a total hip or a total shoulder. Both of those things we can prove, but we have to do it well. And so there are examples in total hips, total knees, ACLs, rotator cuff about these gains. And then we'll have to go further and look at return to work. So I'm not sure it's a bias. We have great value, but you'll see if we do not prove that we have value and we can't demonstrate that and improve our systems, then we're subject to the Congress making decisions and the insurance company making decisions where the money goes. And you know where that's going, cancer, heart disease, and it's going to children's. Not to say they don't deserve it, but if you want to look at quality, if you want to compare quality improvements on patients, orthopedics does extremely well, ranks above a lot of things. And so we have to be able to prove that, not just on a research side, but in clinical practice. So now I'm going to shift gears and talk about evidence, because it's always been a favorite topic of mine since I was a resident. We're going to talk a little bit about the clinical question. What constitutes high evidence? So what papers, when you're finished in your residency program, what papers should you read to change your practice? And what papers can you ignore? The good news is you can ignore 95% of it because only 5% can probably change your practice. And how do you pick that? So clinical research is the evidence-based medicine for clinical care. It's not the rat model. It's not the biomechanics. It has to be shown and studied in, in the clinical model. And it doesn't have to be, I'll show you later, it doesn't have to be a randomized trial. It can be a well-done cohort or well-done registry, depending on the question. And second, you establish the truth. And second, is that truth a clinic meaningful difference? Meaning, does it really improve the patient life? Improves at two points on a scale of zero to 100, where the, the wobble in it is 10 points, that's not relevant. Because once you get to high numbers, everything is significant. And finally, once you have a meaningful difference, is the cost worth it to society or to the patient? So think about two treatments with the same effect size or the same improvement at different costs. Ones that come to me is if you look head to head in randomized trials between a cortisone injection and an HA injection, the efficacy is about the same. Costs are very different, right? $100, whatever. It's tenfold greater in HA. HA may last longer. So in that case, how can you justify, if you're in practice, how can you justify giving HA if you could, rather than at least trying cortisone once? 
you're breaking the bank and the, the cost system involved in doing it. There are many other examples that way. So what is evidence-based medicine? It's not about data. It's not about a cookbook. It's not only following the data. It's using clinician experience. It's asking the patients what they prefer. So if I have a patient that has a trigger finger in their hand, and I look at the literature and say, what is the, what is the improvement if I inject that with cortisone? If I tell the patient the improvement if I inject it at one year is 25%, a certain percentage are going to go to surgery. If I tell them the percentage, the improvement is 50%, I think a few more will go to surgery. Well, a few less will go to surgery. I apologize. If I tell them the success rate of a cortisone injection is 75%, even less will go to surgery. What's the right answer? The right answer is 50%. But depending upon how you counsel that patient and what it, that patient's preference will determine how risk averse they are, but it depends what number you give the patient. So how should we counsel patients? Should we, should we counsel patients based on the literature? Should we counsel patients on your, on your clinical experience or real clinical data? And so clinician experience is, is extremely valuable. All good clinicians know this patient doesn't fit doesn't fit the trial, doesn't fit what's going on. This person's going to do well and not do well. So medicine's always going to be an art, but some things are scientifically driven and you should look at. You shouldn't put an allograph in a high school and college athlete because the data is overwhelming that this will have a higher failure rate involved in that. So now we have to decide experience takes time. So how do you take someone who comes out and practice in, uh, in one year or two years in practice? How do they gain the wisdom and experience they can use, there are ways to do that in the ways of using data. So what data should we use for our clinical decision-making? And um, your evidence-based medicine doesn't say you have to use a randomized trial or a prospective cohort to treat the patient. It just says you have to use the highest available data, whatever that is. But we should recognize whether that data is solid or that data is not solid. And so in several times I've given talks on things that are low frequency, like stress fractures of the navicular. And I may, there may, and I'm in an audience of 500 people, there may be someone out there, a foot and ankle person that's treated 50 of them and has never reported them. That person has more knowledge and probably more data than I do. So we have to always understand how good the data is. So when you're looking at study designs that you can answer questions, it's really very simple. The study designs that have the, that control bias to look for a treatment effect are ones with a control group. And the ones where you have to analyze the control group to see what happens. And this is not, you don't have to be, this is not very sophisticated. If you have no control group, is it same, better, or worse than what when, you, when you're comparing a treatment effect? We all know this hierarchy of studies, which the interesting thing is if you do a systematic review or meta analysis on level four or level three data, that's not, a, that doesn't belong up there. That's, that's on the bottom. That's just hypothesis generating. It's got to be high quality studies. And when I showed you the, the, the trigger finger and, um, and the cortisone injections, those were systematic reviews on randomized trials. So the most important thing is that the clinical question that's important to the patient and important to you determines the study design. It's not everything is a randomized trial. If I want to look at what are the risk factors for post-traumatic arthritis after outcome, or what are the risk factors for infection after a certain procedure, that's not a randomized trial. If I want to look at what causes it, I have to do a large prospective study and find out what are the major risk factors, right? So if I think about arthroplasty, it's probably going to be diabetes. It's going to be a big one. Some comorbidities are going to be a, a big one. BMI may or may not be important. Uh, it probably is relevant, but BMI is very different depending on the structure of the knee. If I want to compare therapy, I can do it two ways. I can do it with a randomized trial when appropriate, and I can do it with a, a cohort study when appropriate too. And the FDA has now changed their philosophy and they wanna look at some real world evidence and that's a cohort study. That can take every patient every time rather than a randomized trial that has a select group of patients. So what is the appropriate study designed to the question? I think if you're looking at something experimental that you wanna put into practice, new technology, major shifts in practice, I think it needs a randomized trial and it needs to be multi-center to see how it's generalizable across the group. I think that if, if, you, uh, if it's not that, if you wanna look at how things perform and identify predictors and prognosis, post-market surveillance, you wanna develop shared decision-making calculators, look at comparative effectiveness, these are all great things for prospective cohorts. 
case controls should only be used if you don't have the numbers. Really, you have too few numbers to ever get them in a, in a cohort or randomized trial. So a cohort is very simple. In fact, the most powerful cohort in the world is the Framingham study. Before the Framingham study came out in the 60s and 70s, Framingham said that hypertension, cholesterol, smoking, physical activity, age, weight, and diabetes has a, has a link to cardiovascular disease, death, and heart attack. They're all trillion dollar industries, but they're all linked to that. And so they exposed that. There's no randomized, there, there have been randomized trials now on lowering hypertension, lowering cholesterol, stopping smoking, and so forth. In, the, in our sports world, it's been moon and Mars because basically when you tear your ACL, the only thing you have in common is you tear your ACL. You have different meniscal tears, you have different sizes, different weights, different sports, different articular cartilage injuries, sometimes in themselves a myriad of things that you have to control for involved in that. So that, that's a good example of a cohort. And so lung cancer has never been proved by smoking in a randomized trial, but the evidence is, is really quite clear in every single study. And so there are good examples. There are examples where they're opportunistic. So when you have an injury to a joint, it could be shoulder, it could be knee, it could be ankle. The, there, there's a myriad of different pathology that happens at the injury, different degrees, of, different degrees of severity. There's also very different patients, right? There's also very different patients, different sizes, different weights, different mental health statuses, different uh, backgrounds, different economics back and forth. And so a cohort is a little bit, a cohort has a relative weakness related to causal inference. But really what a, what a randomized trial does, it controls for factors you don't know make a difference in the outcome, and it randomizes across the group. And again, you have to be aware of things that are really, really rare. So if you said, I want to look at infection, if you, I want to look at your infection rate and the predictors of infection in Moon, we'll talk about tomorrow, we have 3,500 ACLs, that's nothing. We can't do it, throw it out, because we don't have enough infections. The infection rate is less than 1%, you can't study that. So... But you have also, you think a randomized trial doesn't tell you something. A randomized trial tells you that the mean effect, average effect of the people getting the experimental treatment is greater than the mean effect of the control, right? It doesn't tell you who to apply it to. And we make an assumption that everyone in the experimental group gets the same positive effect. Those things are both wrong. The randomized trial tells you when you should put something into practice, doesn't tell you who to put it on. And that's why a lot of very experienced clinicians say, great, it's a randomized trial. I should use this in my practice. How do I apply it? Who do I apply it to? So that's, that's what a cohort does tell you. So the other factor is, is that if you have large medical trials of 20,000 people supported by drug companies, you can then say 10,000 in the experimental, 10,000 in the control. You can then do a regression analysis in the, in the experimental group and say who it applies to, and I'll show you an example. That's, that's not good for us in orthopedics, it's never gonna happen. We're lucky if we can just power it enough to show the mean effect. And so cohorts identify risk factors. And again, the criteria for being a well-done trial is very simple. Strobe is the criteria for a cohort and consort for a randomized trial. So let, let's, let's look at this. This, is, um, this was done by the people, it's called PATH. And what they looked at here is they said that when a doctor has to make a decision on an individual patient, it can't always apply it. And this is looking at, um, they're looking at a randomized trial and a risk model for comparing clot busting agents uh, in, in cardiac disease. And so forget about the, uh, for, looking at the diagram shows the, people who benefit, the risk benefit ratio there. And the blue line is the, is the uh, one, the blue line and the vertical lines are the median and the mean. And basically what it shows is that if you do a regression analysis, you then can, you then can pick out the people who are most likely benefit from the treatment rather than apply it to everyone. And so the right, this is 2020, 2021. And the recommendation is that Yes, a randomized trial is important, but when you look, do a regression analysis, you then can figure out in a clinically meaningful way, which is the individual patient that benefits the most from that treatment. That's a problem for us because we're never going to do 10,000, 100,000, 1,000 studies. We can never, so therefore, we can never figure out who to apply it in a group. because ours, And that makes our sample size become, our sample sizes for randomized trials are relatively small. 
and and we've talked about fragility. Uh, a lot of the trauma people talked about fragility of the outcome, and we're never going to be able to do a regression analysis to interpret. But it's really easy to figure out. You use the randomized trial to it, say the interventions in practice, and then you utilize well done cohorts, right, prospective cohorts, to figure out who actually applies to it, who works to it, what does, what happens, and and for that situation, you can use the best of both. So therefore, you can have a you can have a randomized trial to improve something in practice, and at the same time, you can then prospectively follow it and say these are the patients that ideally do the best involved in that. And remember, everything in medicine is an estimate. This isn't engineering, as my father would say. Why don't you know? It's zero or one. This is the, everything's a probability here. So you're trying to get the best probability that you can. So there's a lot of data now, don't read the slide, there's a lot of data now from uh, systematic reviews in New England Journal of Medicine and from a Cochrane systematic review that when you look at head-to-head -head studies, same, same topic, same treatment, you look at a randomized trial in a cohort, the, out, the effect size and a degree of effect come out the same. So there's not a lot of well-done studies that are done prospectively and well-done studies that are captured things in advance come out with very, very similar outcomes involved in that. And the other problem is a randomized trial is expensive and a cohort study is a lot less expensive. So we have to use both and we have to accept both. And so finally, it's just not that simple though. The more, the older I get, the more I don't know because it's not that simple. So we published a paper on return to play football and it was retro, it, we had collected this prospectively and one of the residents said to me, I want to know how, what percent of patients go back and play football, high school or college. I'm like, why do you ask me that? It's 80%. And he says, where's your data, Kurt? I'm like, I don't know. It's in the literature. Go look it up. Go find it. He goes and, he goes and looks it up. He says, there's nothing in the literature on return to play football, Kurt. There's nothing there. What, what are you telling your patients? I'm like, how do you know what you're saying? I'm like, okay, let's go back. So we, we went back retrospectively and we asked patients, did they return to play high school or college football? And it's a level three study. And we found out that it's not as good as we think. It's 70% high school and college. Then we, that study was repeated um, actually in, in the SEC in the PAC-12 at division one level. It's probably, it's like 90%. But then we asked them, how did you rate your performance? It's like a fish story, right? The further out you get from catching the fish, the bigger it gets. It gets bigger and bigger. And then finally, we asked them reasons not to return to play. So yes, it's level three, but I would bet to you, I don't care whether you, carry, you collected prospectively, whether they've returned to play college football, high school football, I don't care if you ask them on the deathbed, you're going to get the same answer. It's probably pretty solid. Performance, I don't know how you measure it. That's a fish story. I wouldn't trust that data at all. And then reasons to return to play, all I would say is that they, they could say, they could tell me whether they had some component of fear or not. So there's three questions answered here. There's very different levels of evidence that I'm going to trust in here, right? Even though it's level, level three. So that there's, there's a test that you have to look at yourself. And I would, I would suggest to you that we all would trust the return to football or not with about a high, de high degree of certainty. I don't care. It could be return to high school basketball or high school or college basketball. It doesn't matter, male or female. Everyone knows whether they return to the sport or not, yes or no, if they're telling the truth. So when you have to look at, when you, when you look at things, so a simple thing, you do journal clubs. We do journal clubs and journal clubs are important because you're trying to look at the mechanism behind, you're trying to look at what things can happen in the future. But in reality, it's very simple to look at studies that should change your practice when you get out there. There's only two study designs. So if, if you have a, if you have a um, randomized trial, it should follow consort criteria. And if you, if you have an observational trial in a cohort, you have to adjust for things like age, smoking, BMI, and mental health. Because if you don't control for that, that can have a very big effect on the outcome. You have to perform multivariate analysis. So basically what happens is it's very, very simple. You have two study designs. You have a randomized trial. You have an observational cohort. If they undergo multivariate analysis and intention to treat, probably worth changing your practice. Everything else, you can put it into hypothesis generating. You can use it, but it's kind of like building your house on sand, not that stable. Things that, things that have been done in really large studies that take a million dollars or more, probably pretty stable. It's not gonna, it's not gonna change that with time. And in the sports world, the biggest thing was when um, is double bundle ACL. People pushed it to come out with double bundle ACL and people fought back and said, you shouldn't do that. You should wait to see exactly what, you should do randomized trials and do it. When the trials were done, 
no one does almost no one does double bundle ACL anymore. The reason why is there's not a, there's not a great advantage clinically when you, when you do it, but when double bundle goes wrong, it's a disaster. You have two huge tunnels in the femur, two huge tunnels in the tibia. Now you got to bone graft them and to go back, it's a disaster. But that, but again, it's, it's the literature, the good science that found out very consistently that there was no difference in that. So finally, I want to look at some examples of why co cohorts I've been involved in. I've been involved in randomized trials too. And I have a randomized trial now and looking at ACL repair with a tissue engineer construct versus a, a BTB. But I think you should have that in, in that setting to put it in. But I've been involved in a lot of cohorts and you can get a lot of information. So the second thing we do wrong is we think that a single risk factor or univariate analysis guides clinical decisions. We do that all the time because that's the way we were taught. We're taught in TSS. That's wrong. That doesn't work. And every clinician knows that. If you're taking care of a patient, there's a gestalt. Even good clinicians look at a gestalt and what's going on with that patient. You're trying to look at their mental. You're trying to think about whether they can be compliant, right? You're trying to look about is, is someone's, if someone has a huge BMI, how are they going to go on crutches? What are you going to do with them? You're going to have to take crutches from a scooter. You're really doing that in your head as a clinician, but you also can quantify it. And then I'm going to show you a little simple. Um, question is, uh, residents, when you do arthroscopy, how many pi narcotic pills do you give out after arthroscopy? Zero, 10, 15, what do you do? And how many is that for simple arthroscopy? Okay, good. I'm going to show you a simple thing that will change it. Um, and finally, where, where do we go with, where do we go with prompts? And so when you look at multivariate modeling, don't look at the specifics of it. It probably doesn't matter how you do it. But if you think about it, if your outcome is pain or function, then you have to take into account what treatment you did. You have to take into account some idea of disease severity. You have to take into account the characteristics of the patient, which are age, gender, smoking, BMI, race, and socioeconomic factors. And then you have to capture a specific problem a general problem or a joint specific problem. It's just that easy. It's not that difficult. And if you look at things that don't capture that, you don't need to read it anymore. You can just throw it away. And so in Moon and Mars, you know, if you think about whether it's knee pain or whether it's, you know, Mark's activity or mental health, you can think about all the factors that are there. You have to sort of control them, which means you need big numbers, right? Which means you need numbers of, you know, hundreds or, or a thousand people to do that. And there are, there are, there are good studies that have these kind of numbers. <laughs> So first, I said it's a fallacy to look at one thing. So we published a paper on uh, in Moon on looking at allografts failing more than autographs. And the red line right there is the allograft line. And you can see that it's a problem. It's a three to one ratio, whether you're 18 or three to one ratio at 40. So it's not the odds ratio that's important. It's the absolute difference. Because at 40, it's 2.4 versus 0.8. It's a difference of 1.6. I mean, that, that's very, very small. At, at 18, it's now 18% uh, failure versus 6% failure. Same odds ratio, very different for the patient, right? Because now you have a huge difference in failure. So we published that and said, you know, age is a problem. And we also could look at activity level, but we couldn't, they were too linked together, so we couldn't separate. So we did age because everyone knows the age of the patient. Well, then we said, well, maybe it's not so simple. Maybe, the, maybe there's a problem when we look at, high school and college kids, because if you go back, look at this, what perplexed us was the, the red, I'm sorry, was the green and the black, right? So in this area here, we looked at the green line, hamstring line was going up, and then the BTB line was there, and they were diverging when they got younger. So it said, even though we couldn't show a difference there, we said, you know what, maybe there's something there. This is all comers. So this basically is 2,500 primary ACLs, 92% follow-up at two years. Pretty good follow-up. And so now we said, okay, let's take only high school and college athletes, only people with the highest marks activity level. We're only going to take autograph BTB and autograph hamstring, and we're going to see what happens. We did it at two years, and, our, and we modeled it two different ways, and our answers didn't come consistent. We had a big, um, had a big debate. And we shelved it because we weren't in unanimous agreement, 19 of us. And so we went out six years to get more, get more failures. And when we did that, we, we controlled for all the things that you think you would control for. And what we found is that, again, if you want to look at someone's failure, 
it's not just age. It's BTB versus hamstring. Hamstring fails more and high-grade laxity. Well, high-grade laxity for us is something that is a very loose knee. It has greater than 10. It's, it's a, the knee that's just so sloppy and loose. And then if we look at the contralateral knee, which people still don't get, they say BTB fails on the other side. No, it's a sported injury. It's football. And football is a problem because most people put, put BTB in football players and they fail higher with that. And so if you want to know, if you want to know if, if which graft is better, you have to use a QR code. And in the QR code, you can put your phone up, it's there, and you can look at it, and it'll just tell you. It asks your activity, it asks your age, it asks what it is, and says, this is your failure rate for a BTB and hamstring. This is, and sometimes it says whether it's it's 2% different and 3% difference or 5% difference. And sometimes it says whether it's different, whether you're high grade laxity or not. And so how do, how do people interpret it? That's too complicated. It's not complicated for the young folks because you know how to do that. But for the old folks, it's just anyone else. It's too complicated. I'll just use a BTB. That's not what we said. We never said just use a BTB. We said, look what it is. In fact, if you look at a lacrosse player, if you look at a lacrosse player, it's probably no difference because we don't, because that's another category. Look at a football player and younger, then BTB has a clear advantage. But it's not, it doesn't lose, but it doesn't always win. And then the other problem is when you look in the data, and he, at, in another detail, you know, our data is football, basketball, soccer, and other. So if you ask me what's the best graph for a volleyball player, I don't know. That's put in other. I don't know what that is. You ask me the gra best graph for a skier, I can't separate a skier out. Now you can say a skier much like something else. So you really, so again, it's not just a matter of applying it. It's also understanding it, but no one wants to, no one wants to apply it. And these are the things that we can do. It, it's there. It's on the website. People can look at it. So the problem then becomes, if you say, if you say, okay, well, I really want to know something at a different level. The problem is, is that if you look at your sample size cal uh, calculator, this is out of Holly's book. Holly wrote the best clinical research book out of San Francisco, the statistical group there, they're terrific. If I'm baseline risk of failure is 5%, and I have a very effective treatment that lowers it in half at 2.5, I can do a randomized trial. I just need 2,000 patients. Right. It's totally impractical. Now, think about what goes on in the hospital where you say, I have an infection rate of 3%, and I want to lower it down to, uh, I want to lower it down to, to 2%. Okay, well, you know, you, you can do it, but I mean, you can't scientifically do it without a large randomized trial to do that. So that, that's where cohorts become really valuable. So when you do an arthroscopy, the one thing I can maybe give you when you do an arthroscopy, uh, you can talk simple arthroscopy, simple partial medial meniscectomy, simple, you give out four narcotic pills, period. That's all you need. So one of our fellows came in. He was in the military. Um, next use, uh, um, and he watched one of his uh, friends die of an overdose from pills hanging around. So it was really so. What we did is we went back and looked at. We looked at said, okay, we're doing simple arthroscopy. So we just followed. We just followed about 140 patients a year. We came back and looked at their pill count when they came back in a week and said, okay, how many pills did you use? And so our old standard, we gave out 30 pills. And I'm going to ask you later to residents why we give out 30 pills. So you're going to have to answer that. And so now we, what we learned is that the that 50% of people never took a narcotic. So we we all inject the knee with local anesthetic. We all use some ice, right? And we all use a non steroid. That, that's a base of it. Very simple. And 50% never used one. The other the average number was two. And so we decided we're going to give out four. And that's all we give out is four. Why? Because someone in the middle of the night, what happens at 12 or one or two o'clock in the middle of the night is a problem, right? Because now you, now you got to go to the ER, it creates a disaster. So we give out four. So why did we give out 30? Why did we do that from the physician perspective? We had no data, but otherwise, why did we do that? We didn't want to get a call, right? We did it. To, we did it. We didn't do it for the best thing for the patient. We did it because if we gave out thirty, we wouldn't get a call. We lessened the likelihood they would call back in and do it. But you need four, right? And that and that should be done. So the question is, even when we have it, there's nothing special. We're not him. You know, we're not any better surgeons, worse surgeons, I hope, than anyone else. So that's all you need. So we, the use of narcotics 
is it, that's a long that could be a lecture in itself how the government created the the fifth vital sign which was wrong and all the rest of that stuff that's a whole mess but the fact is you need four so i'd like you to use four and and if you're in you know any i'm happy to talk to any of your attendees mia you're using four right now no more okay no choice acls we went from 30 down to 12. And I actually think you can eliminate it, but I just think that, so what happens, so why is it important? If we give out 30, the rest of the narcotic medicine is sitting where? It's sitting at home, right? Every teenager, every kid knows well, every medicine in, in mom and dad's thing. They just know it. I mean, they know it's there. And so it creates a problem because that, all that stuff is hanging around. And plus it's all, it's all a waste of money. And so if, there, if there's a million arthroscopies that are 30 pills are given out, there's a lot of stuff sitting out there on the black market kids get into. If you do four, it's a lot better. So now we'll shift to, to future payment models. This is our problem in orthopedics because we do things that, that make life worth living and return to work. Other fields save lives. So when you have a limited supply of when you have a limited supply of money that you have to dole out, you have to decide whether it's cardiovascular, it's going to go to cardiovascular transplant oncology pediatrics because it's a zero sum game. And Medicare plays a zero sum game. They they have so much money they're going to give. That's why they have more knee replacements that need to be done than than as as we get older. Um, and so they're just going to ratchet down the amount of money they pay for knee replacements. That's their approach to it. And so they can get more done. The approach should be to have better quality and not to look at some of the other things that are a problem. So again, but we have we have the ability to do that. So I'm going to run through this quickly. We set up a system, a cohort system that captured patient reported outcomes on every single orthopedic procedure in the Cleveland Clinic system in Northeast Ohio and Florida, and including spine. And it's not expensive. We can talk about that later. We started it on my birthday on 15. That's why we started on February 18th. Just as we now we have 99 surgeons, we have uh, nine hospitals, seven eight ASCs, and so this is the, the first was knee, hip, and shoulder, and we now do foot and ankle, we do spine, and we do hand, hand and upper extremity. So we have something where we capture. Does any of the residents know what felt know what that is? It's 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 like a palm pilot, yeah, but it's called an IPAC way back when. We tried to collect electronically back in 2004. It was a complete disaster. Now you can collect electronic because the systems are better. What year did the iPhone come out? iPhone? No, 07. 07, 07, yeah. So we actually, the surgeons capture some stuff as well. So what we have, I just want you to see, what we have here is, you know, we've captured now, uh, this was at the end of last year, we've captured 74,000 cases with a uh, capture rate above 90%. Patients have filled out their prompts, 65,000 patients. Surgeons have filled it out. Our complete list rate is 92% for knee, hip, and shoulder. Not bad. And it costs, you want to know what it costs? It costs about $25 to $30 an episode. But yet we can't get the hospital pay for it. But they put a squeezing device, a compression device, on the opposite knee of a knee scope, which is a complete waste of money. We have New England Journal of Medicine to show that, but yet they won't pay for something valuable. That's why we have to change it. So it's a system, it's a complicated branching logic system. It has automatic triggers. It, it follows people up um, by automatic text messaging, web messaging, my chart messaging, and it has a person to get follow up. And so we only follow up at one time point in one year. And our follow up on the first almost 50,000 cases at one year is 75%. So we can publish directly out of that. We probably have, we have 20,000 total joints now. Look at the numbers, 12. We, now we have almost 20,000 total joints with nearly 80% follow-up on patient recovery. If you don't recover at one year, you're not good. There's no data in the literature saying that you're going to be better at two years or one year. It, it, it's synonymous. And so we published 56 papers and we modeled the system there. And there are a lot of papers in progress, but you can do it. But again, we don't get, get but it has to be a value. It's not of clinical value yet but it should be of clinical value. And so here's, I look at, the, we can do department performance. So these are our, this is again, this is uh, total hips and total knees. You can look at them, the number of people who improve. It's very simple looking at this. This is zero, this is the one year minus the baseline. Anything within a red bar is not clinically different. Anything above the red bar is good. Below the red bar is bad. 
So this is, we can get, we can look at uh, overall. And then we can look at individual surgeon data from TKA performance, how individual surgeons do. And we can see what, what their average improvement is going to be. We can look at for total knee, look at total hip. There's nothing else in life. You, there's no medical treatment. Very few medical treatments you can get 50 point improvement in pain in total hip. We can look at ACLs. I don't know where I am anymore. I'm somewhere there. I, I, I don't know anymore. We look at that. I want to know why some people drop below the bar. That's interesting. That worse. So what can we say? Multi-center cohorts are very impactful. They can show how things really work in the real world. We, you, have to get involved in proms. Proms have to be the standard of what we do. Proms have to be something, just like we collect anything else on a patient, that's the most important thing to me. Is it the most important thing, the outcome of the patient? No. There are other things that are really important. But that's something we can collect that's really important to the patient we can do it at cost and we can prove the value of what we do. The other thing we have to collect is return to work. So getting people back to work is critical because that's what pays the medical bills for the other things. You need a randomized trial to prove new technology. I'm the PI of a multi-center study on, on BEAR, uh, which is bridge enhanced ACL repair. So you need that to bring it into practice because just because you can do it in one center in Boston doesn't mean you can do it across the country and do that. So personalized medicine is here. Personalized medicine is not only about genetics. Personalized medicine is something about shared decision making. It's using QR calculators. I can we can create a QR calculator we have, and that's where my conflict comes in. We created a QR calculator of what the patient's expected recovery is for total knees, total hips, arthroscopic partial mastectomy, and rotator cuff repair. We can use that as a shared decision making with the patient. You know what? They don't understand improvements in pain and function, but what they do understand is pass patient acceptable symptom state. Yes, I'm better. No, I'm not better. They understand that. And finally, working in teams, working on multi-center groups and working in a team in, in medicine is a team environment. It's just really secret to success in, in orthopedics in life because it's fun to work in a team. It's fun to accomplish things. Nothing great ever gets accomplished by a single individual. That happened in the 50s. Things are too complex now. You need huge teams to do things and to put it together. And I would argue that if you think about really things that happen, whether it's whether it's putting a man on the moon or a person on the moon, I shouldn't say that. It could be a woman on the moon. We could have done that. But doing things that are great like that or, or, or building that on bomb, whatever, these are just gigantic great teams. So in the literature, it's very simple. Hypothesis testing, those are things that you want to... Uh, uh, those are that's a solid ground by which you incorporate things into your practice. You do that with randomized trials and large cohorts. And finally, hypothesis generating, those are great. Those generate the ideas, the feasibility, the preliminary data, the risk factors that you look at and study more. Orthopedics now, we should establish our clinical practice guidelines not only based on randomized trial, that's for drug trials. It's easy to do a randomized trial in, in drugs. It's so simple. Placebo versus non-placebo, and guess what? Doesn't work. Then six months later, you give them the active group, so no one's harmed. That's so simple. Like the fact that they can't do the right trials for stem cells and PRP and everything else, there's no excuse involved in that. Zero excuse. Where you can't take back surgery. Once you do surgery, you can't say, oh, we're going to take it back and do it again. Very difficult to do. Difficult challenges that, ha that happen there. So we now are beginning to look at good prospective data in our guidelines in orthopedics that say we have high evidence, right? Not just based on a randomized trial. And, and I think that, you know, any of the things you look at, you have to take into account the unique characteristics of the patient. And all really good clinicians, master clinicians do that. And I don't think that QR code is ever going to be better ever going to be better than a master clinician. But how long does it take to get to be a master clinician? What do you do in the first 10 years of your practice? And what about the people, what about individuals that are that are, want to do speed and don't have the time to sit and talk to patients? That, that, I think that's where that QR code is. It can be very helpful. So outcomes are not new. Katz and Stan talked about it in 1908. Codman is the father of shoulder surgery, but he's actually the father of said every surgical procedure, not just orthopedics, should be followed to its end result. Our end result is one year. It could be earlier than that. And finally, we had a great person, uh, Sandy Kirkley, who did nine randomized trials. Uh, unfortunately, she died at 41 in a plane crash. She was fine. But I don't, this is Codman's article. 
Codman published that in the Boston Globe and then got him fired from Harvard because he said, we have aus- or, or, we're, we're literally like an ostrich, we're head in the sand, we're not following. I submit to you that that may be as appropriate now. Orthopedics needs to, you know, everyone, we, they, they need leadership to be able to say, we need to collect what we do. Don't be afraid, collect what we do. We have the data, we interpret it, and we do really well involved in doing that. So uh, some grant funding that we've had in the past for Moon, um, this is your, uh, this is a Colorado doc right here, Eric McCarty, from my residency at University of Colorado doc. And finally, the NIH for all its support. So congratulations to the residents and fellows. You picked a great field. You make people better. Your future is bright. You can make really positive impacts on your patients' lives. Um, I do think that your compensation money, because that's the only thing that matters. Uh, in, in our society, it's, it's money is important. So you're going to be required to prove your surgical outcomes. We're going to have, we need to define orthopedics, what's, what value is, what the right outcome is, how good you should be. And I think if you just use evidence-based, if you just use evidence-based medicine principles, then you won't get, you won't get in the situation where you're doing things to make money. Cause there are people out there that use it, that don't treat it as a profession, make money. And there's really no excuse to that. So thank you. I look forward to your questions. So we have another group coming in. We have 10 minutes for questions. And I would just ask um, people who are remote to text me. And if you're here, please use the microphone. Any questions? And please just introduce yourself. Jason Shu, uh, shoulder surgery. So a uh, couple questions, great talk. Um, I had a question about follow-up. So you mentioned at the very end that one year follow-up is pretty much what we look at at orthopedics, but for arthroplasty, we're concerned with five-year, 10-year follow-up. Is there value in longer-term follow-up and spending the money to do long-term observational cohorts for those uh, groups or not? There's always, the, there's always good to do longer follow-up. Um, the follow-up in the registry on long-term follow-up says all the implant survival is the same. And, and I, so I think that you'll find, you'll differentiate it one year. It costs for us, we do 20,000 cases a year, uh, in Cleveland clinic, it costs a quarter million dollars to get 70% follow-up on 20,000 cases at one year. So, um, so I, I just think you first, you have to prove it works, right? So step number one is prove it works. I think the whole metric for a total joint is wrong. It's not survival. Who cares if the joint's in there? If it doesn't work, if the patient doesn't work, you didn't pick the right patient, they can't go back to what they want to do. So you can measure that at one year. Survival is, so survival was a problem early on in total joints. It's not a problem now. So now you got to figure out what's a value, right? Again, go back. What's a value? The value is that I put a joint in and now I, I get I get a pleased patient, quality of life is good, and I get them back to work. So you got to measure it at one year. Uh, second question is related to comparing orthopedics versus cardiovascular and oncology. You had a slide in this, but I may have missed it. With uh, orthopedics, we're so focused on joint-specific uh, outcomes, and a lot of people don't get these general health-related uh, quality of life um, you know, uh, scores. So uh, when you look at the responsiveness of those scores, they're not as great when you look at total hip. And, well, for total hip, they are, but you see a lot of responses in just the joint-specific scores. Uh, how do you compare cardiovascular and oncology when we're looking at such different things? You you kind of talked about that briefly, but yeah, I, I I ducked it because it's it's more so they basically have a choice of three different uh, uh, general patient. When you do patient reported outcomes, you have to have a general measure. So you either have EQ five D Promise ten or VR twelve SF twelve. Those are your three choices. Everything else is specific. So we need to in order to fine tune what we do, we need joint specific areas. Um, but the, when you look at those other forms, we do really well against cardiovascular. We do well against every other part of medicine. We do extremely well on that. And we do, we do, uh, very well. The, so you have to, you have to collect that. And, and it's a complicated thing. The EQ 5D is what the, what Europe uses back and forth. I do think the problem with the, the, um, the generic measures, they're lower extremity biased. So the upper extremity has a problem because they don't, they're not responsive at all when it comes to upper extremity like shoulder. They're not responsive when it comes to hand and when it comes to elbow and those things, it's not responsive. They are pretty good, but not as responsive. It's still pretty good for lower extremity. 
Yeah, thank you, Kurt. That was a great talk. I have a few um, questions. The first one is from Dr. Yenda, who's one of our pediatric surgeons. And her question is, why is intent to treat so important? If patients change groups, it seems like you should evaluate what treatment they actually received. Um, intent to treat it. So, so the only advantage of a randomized trial is the fact that there are uh, patient expectation, uh, mental health, and emotional things related to the patient, and things that we can't measure. And that's and that that's get that gets randomized across two different categories. And so when you when the, when you and that's why you have to analyze by intention to treat. But once you cross over, once you cross over more than twenty percent you violate a lot of the principles of the intention to treat analysis. So it's, it's complicated. And the next question is, it's more of a, a comment um, that we would expect from Dr. Manor, who's one of our joint surgeons. We've got great data that hyaluronic acid um, and arthroscopy are no better than cortisone for, to treat degenerative meniscal tears. Um, why are we still doing HA injections and scoping knees for degenerative tears? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I don't know why we're doing HA because I don't think HA, I think Blue Cross Blue Shield won't cover it. I don't know if they're big out here, but we're in the East, they won't cover it. With so, permission, you yeah. know, we have to get- So I don't, I don't think we should be doing a lot of HA. And, and I think that when we published the study on, um, on meniscus tears in OA, the first treatment for it is should be rehab. You can do a cortisone injection, but the treatment is rehab, which will get 60% of the people better but then 40% uh, of the people fail. Only after they fail rehab and an injection and they have a meniscus tear are they candidates for arthroscopy. That's the appropriate use of arthroscopy. Um, um, Dr. Clavino, one of our trauma surgeons has a question and I think he can um, do that yeah. remotely via Zoom. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Oh yeah. Okay, hey, hey, Kurt. Thank. Great talk. Sorry, I'm not there. I'm on call at the other hospital. I uh, totally agree with uh, a lot of what you started out with. Your premise. You know, 20 percent of our GDP and most of the consumer market doesn't know the value. So my question is, and I have an anecdote to sort of pose it: is how do we resolve some of the conflicts with the objective problems and subjective problems? So my anecdote is a number of years ago, I took a course at Harvard Business School with Michael Porter, who, as you know, sort of self-professed yeah. national expert on value, and he flew out of Boston, flew over New York, over Pennsylvania to get his hip done in Florida and sort of like, you know, kind of giving a model of, well, the total joints had an integrative model with, you know, psychologist and nutrition and PT. And months later, giving the course, he's still walking around with the Trendelenburg gate. So the expert in the country on value had no idea that his value as we see it as clinicians actually wasn't optimized, but he loved it, right? So and you see this all the time, you know, people on the commercials, you know, saying that they're patients of a stem cell guy and how much their shoulder feels better. So how do we resolve the conflicts or do we just use it and say, look how much our patients are doing better. You should pay for these procedures because they love what we do in orthopedics because we have that advantage. Well, the, the total hip um, example is is clear that he, he feels better because of his pain relief, which was achieved. But you would consider not as much a success if you measured his function. Right, and looked at it, you probably would be lower in that because you didn't achieve the functional criteria. Um, it would, is that is that a safe assessment? Yeah, even in the hoos and coos, they're sort of subjective, you know, extreme, you know, what their improvements are, what they are sort of up to the patient and how they well, relate to this, their relationship yeah. with their surgery. Well, yeah, I think that the psychometric, so it doesn't, nothing is subjective and objective. Every, every measurement has a uh, degree of test, retest. Every measurement has a degree of uh, improvement. And when you look at the psychometric properties, they're really good. They're much better than our physical exam properties for sure. Uh, that's that that's been tested many times. So the only way to get it better would be to uh, to wear a sensor on it, uh, some sort of sensor on his leg. But I would say, from my point of view, you know, it's crazy to fly wherever he flew. But uh, the bottom line is, he got better with pain, and we should celebrate that. Now, that's a very different story when it comes to stem cells and when it comes to that. And and I sit on a very large data safety monitor, and I've sat on two large data safety monitoring boards where they've compared stem cells and cortisone and PRP. And I can tell you that um, none of the studies that have been published. They were a thousand patients. There was no difference. So I I don't I think when it comes to an injection. I think in that point, you need, to, you need to test. There's no excuse for testing it. There's no excuse for saying, you know what? We have a control group. We think you're going to get better at six months with stem cells. 
So we're going to compare stem cells versus that. And, and six months later, we'll give you the stem cells we want. So everyone gets it in a chronic condition. So that should be studied scientifically valid and, and because I think we're going to find out that they don't work well. So this is a specific question about the Cleveland Clinic since you're on the topic of stem cells, which is here, it's pretty contentious. I would say the orthopedic surgeons are, you know, um, have a healthy skepticism towards it, but our family medicine and rehabilitation medicine doctors, probably not so much. Um, so how, how are they being used at the Cleveland Clinic stem cells? We have very few people, at least in the orthopedic realm. We've uh, we only have a few people doing that, and they're doing that. We we wanted them to do it under uh, under a protocol, and so what they, we're actually using the same thing we use for joints to follow it prospectively. You said if you're going to do it, you're going to have to follow your outcomes and figure out which patients it works on. Thank you. Really enjoyed your talk, Reza buddy. Uh, I do orthopedic trauma. My question is more of a logistics question. It's really impressive the numbers you have with the program you have at Cleveland Clinic, especially at the one-year follow-up time point. How do you exactly get to that state where you can have such high follow-up rates and such a large volume of patients? How are you enticing these patients to actually report their outcomes? Well, we've never been able to figure out how to do it in trauma. So I just let you know, it's too difficult. And uh, it is because you can't give it to the patient before surgery, right? They're coming in. And so, you know, Mark Swinkowski and I had a long discussion about that. And, and trauma is a very difficult, very, very difficult. And the follow is very difficult. For us, what it is, is, is we, we have a system, a, a system that we ask the patient how they want to be followed up. There's no incentive for the patient. Because if even if I gave them $10, $10 it would be $200,000. The whole system costs about $350,000. To run per year. It's not that not ridiculously expensive, but it's still a lot of money. Um, so what we do is that we have a trigger. So the first thing goes to my chart, their internal EMR system. Next thing is a text message. Next thing is an email. We can get anywhere between with what I call passive triggers, meaning that no human involved in it, just automatically set up anywhere between 30 and 45% with that. But to get over the 70%, we have five people, that's the quarter million dollars five people employed full-time that each can follow 4,000 patients and that they call them, remind them and send it out and do those kind of things. That's not, that is, that is not scalable. But the point is that it doesn't cost us any money to collect because we teach the PSRs and when they come in as part of the normal routine that you hand the person an iPad and we monitor their compliance and we show them how well they do. Uh, and so that we track that really carefully. Another trauma question from Dr. Bure. Given the challenges with caring for the trauma population, um, i.e. socioeconomic employment follow-up, what do you think constitutes value as an outcome or endpoint? How do we measure value in caring for those trauma patients? You know, I, I really don't know the answer to that. I, I, I only know that I probably know the answer a little bit when it comes to knee surgery. Uh, but outside of that, it's really, it's really for the, um, it's really for the people in the field, for the trauma people to define that, define what it is. And, and also for some focus groups or whatever it trauma is very difficult, not being able to solve it. The only way that you have two choices, you have two choices to do follow-up. Um, number one choice Going to Mark Swinkowski, one choice is, and he trained, he, he was here a while, way back when. Um, one choice is to give them the patient reported outcome when they come back at about a month, when they're not out of pain, and say, How were you before? And the only other person is to use age match controls, neither of which are ideal. So I, I, I think that I think you'll have to. There's no question that that trauma and the things that we do have made a huge impact. One of the one of the biggest advances in orthopedics. But I think we have to figure out how do we measure that and, and how do we do that. And it's very different between the person that is a working individual that is in, in an auto accident versus the uh, person in a nursing home that then fractures their hip. I mean, those are the spectrum is so so huge. And then pediatrics is completely different. So it, it's tough. And, and one question I have in the medical literature, you know, or reading oncology, for example, I see a lot more of the use of quality adjusted life years and disability adjusted life years. It would seem if we want to really measure value and impact on society of what we're doing, that those should be measures we talk a little bit more about. Um, yes, we've actually, uh, when John Callahan was a AOS president, 
we did some work on that, did some work for rotator cuff. We actually published one on ACLs. We'll show tomorrow night. Um, no, when you look at those metrics, we do extremely well we, we, in orthopedics. Like I'm saying, if you compare, would you rather, it's a problem because people on dialysis aren't happy. I yeah. mean, their, their, qual their quality adjusted life years are pretty low. People that get a joint replacement or get fixed to something, they're really high. So that's why we have to look at these. So we spend more time fighting amongst ourselves instead of saying like, the, uh, instead of celebrating the, the great success we have and then worry, because that's important. The success is important. And I think if you measure something like anything else in life, if you want to improve it, if you've got to measure it, you have to define it, you have to measure it, then you have to have some reward for doing it. And then you have to have some compensation. So we, we should define what we do. Um, if you think about it, we get paid for performing a procedure. We should get paid for performing it well, right? And then everyone would improve because once you're measured, right? Once it's a simple business thing, if I, once you're measured on something, you're going to improve. Yeah. And you have to be careful because you don't want measurements to not to take the tough case, not to take the personal disadvantage area. But what you'll find out <clears throat> when we do a lot of the things with uh, access and diversity and so forth, the biggest driver is, is, socio is socioeconomic, meaning poverty. It's not, it's not, yes, there are cultural differences and yes, there are biases with race and there are biases, but the biggest driver, the biggest thing is that people that are poor are disadvantaged. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you're from. You're, you're poor. You're disadvantaged, and that's a real problem in the system. Ideally, the internet should be able to accomplish that, right? Because you could put home exercise programs, figure things out. But if you don't measure it, you can't figure it out. So once you measure it, then you can say, "How do I improve it?" Many years ago, you probably are aware of this study. There was a study that looked at quality and disability adjusted life years for a whole range of of medical and surgical procedures. And if I recall, total hip replacement came out at the absolute top of that yeah. list. And that was comparing, um, you know, total hips to, you know, cabbages and yes, all sorts of other procedures that, you know, potentially saved and prolonged life. So what we do is really helpful and important, and we just have to be able to show it. We just have to, we have to, we have to do it. So this, so the, you know, my plate on the research side in Moon, you'll hear about that more tomorrow night, um, looking at post-traumatic arthritis. And then, so this was, a, this was a real world test at the clinic to say, can you do it? Can you do it where you can, where you can cost it out? And, and can you do it? So from the academy's point of view, I actually lead a, a proms team on the academy. I don't, not that I think proms is the only way to go. I do not. But how else are you going to follow 10,000 patients? They're going to come back on site? No. The number of people who come back after a joint replacement at one year that are told to come back, what do you think the percentage is, residents? Huh? Less than 20. So you got 80% lost. Why, why would you come back and pay money and lose a half a day of work and pay for parking, right? You wouldn't do, you're not stupid, you're doing fine. So prom, but proms are a way that work really well and it's what we treat. And you can follow that at scale. You can follow that on your iPhone, on your red cap and do that. So that, that's a really important thing to do. And I think that the government, we need to collect it. We can do that almost for free. It's not that difficult to do if you put in a workflow. But the government needs to incentivize the individuals when they collect it to give them reimbursement and also incentivize the individual to give us a one-year follow-up time point so we can measure what we do. What I like about that is if you go through the history of medicine, different groups have dominated the finances and control. The control now is all in the insurance companies. Physicians don't have control, patients don't have control. But think about it. If orthopedics collected a prom on every patient and kept it, your academy or someone kept it, now the doctors and the patients have all the data on what works. Who is in control now? Not the insurance company anymore. So to me, it's a matter of physicians making a decision what to do. And to say that all arthroscopy doesn't work for meniscus tears in a way is not what the literature says. It should be done thoughtfully. If I flip the question and say, you have three months to recover, you show up in my office with a meniscus tear and with, and, and with uh, OA, what's the way, what is the highest likelihood of getting better in three months? It's an arthroscopy, right? Out of the media data, New England Journal of Medicine, you can look at it. So again, it depends on the question. It's not that simple. Most people should go to rehab first. So we should, physicians, thoughtful physicians and patients should be able to make decisions. That's the model I like. And that's the model I think we want to get to. Now it's insurance company. 
you know, and if you look at if if read read the fine print sometimes on these these cancer drugs, that that are hundred thousand dollars a month, and they buy you six more weeks of life. If you look at the bottom line and the bottom, line, six more weeks of life for a hundred for hundred thousand dollars times six. Well, how many joint replacements can we? How many people can we improve in orthopedics on that? It's enormous. In fact, the biological treatments are much more expensive than any joint replacement. Joint replacements are the most cost-effective thing that I think you can do for someone that's probably 60 or 65. There, there's, it's such a great thing. So what we need to work together and celebrate that and, and collect what we do, improve what we do, because we're extreme value. We're extreme value to society. Yeah. Just um, for the residents who may not be aware, so we are now di collecting digital proms for spine, shoulder and elbow, um, foot and ankle, total joints, um, some trauma. Um, so we're really um, getting there. I'm not sure about hand, although I suspect we are also. Um, and we will soon have that epic patient navigator, which, uh, or digital navigator, which I think will introduce another um, element into our ability to collect data. The last thing I wanted to say is we are in a world of value-based care. It's not a huge component of what we do right now, but it's it's Coming. getting there. And for example, we have a contract with Boeing that is uh, a fixed amount of dollars per capita. And, and so there have been years when we've actually, UW Medicine has taken a little bit of a hit on that contract, years when we've uh, made a nice profit. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, the, the incentives aren't really aligned. We get paid the same no matter what. So if we do arthroscopy on one of those patients, who has a degenerative meniscal tear, it's helping the department, it's helping the surgeon, may not be helping the patient, and it's hurting the contract that UW Medicine um, has with Boeing. So that error is here, so. I think that's why you practice the best evidence, right? And then you don't worry so much about, it. you shouldn't switch. Your practice in the ideal world, I'm an idealist, I understand that, and, and everyone knows that. But in the ideal world, your practice shouldn't switch that much if you're practicing the best evidence, what, what the payment incentive model is, because you should be doing the right thing for the patient, right? Things that have value. You shouldn't be giving every ACL patient a functional brace afterwards when there's no data to support that. In fact, the, uh, the data is the other knee is going to fail the same as the knee reconstructed. So which knee, if mom wants it, then ask mom which knee that you want to put it on, which knee you want to protect. Not that it protects any knee, it doesn't, but that's a whole different story. So practice the best evidence, you won't be shifting back and forth, so. Yeah, we, we have to wrap it up. So thank you, Dr. Smith.